Welcome back, guys. Today, uh, we're actually going to take a, a break from uh, content from the textbook, and I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, COVID-19, kind of where th things are at uh, from a scientific point of view. Um, so I apologize, this might be a little bit longer than your usual video. I may not have as many uh, questions from slide to slide, but it might be a little bit longer. So yesterday we talked about how your immune system remembers invaders that it's had before and how it knows to go and target them again if you get them again. Um, and then we talked about a specific disease, Ebola, and why it was particularly lethal. Um, but at the end, I kind of wrapped up with why we were able to contain it. Uh, and I said that this coronavirus that we've got right now is actually suffering from the opposite problem. So we'll try to get into that. Um, just a couple of little side notes here. Uh, first of all, this is what we currently know or suspect about the virus. Um, so if we get more information from studying it, some of this may change or we might get some kind of clarification. Um, and I'm going to try to dispel some misinformation. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to try to be as non-political as possible here and just say exactly from the scientific point of view what I think is uh, what, we, what we should actually be doing, um, regardless of whatever the politicians want us to do. So... Um, it's, it's called COVID-19, uh, because it first appeared in 2019. And I want to clear that up because there's some, for some reason, uh, there's a rumor that, oh, this is the 19th version of it. How it can't possibly be that bad. That's not what that means. Uh, it means that it first appeared in late 2019. That's where that 19 comes from. So, uh, d just go ahead and dispel that rumor there. It's not been 19 versions of this before that haven't been that bad. Uh, that's, it's not the way to look at this. Okay. That's where that number comes from. But first of all, Let's talk about what are coronaviruses, okay? It's a classification of viruses. Uh, so this COVID-19 is not the only coronavirus that existed. Um, it's a type of virus that infects mammals and birds. It release, uh, results in mild to lethal illnesses that include symptoms similar to common colds, okay? Uh, and common colds are caused by rhinoviruses, which is a different classification of viruses. So um, they're going to have similar symptoms, though. And so that's kind of... Part of the problem with this that we'll find out is that unlike things like Ebola, where the symptoms are extremely severe, they're easily recognized, this blends right in with the common cold, and then it starts in the middle of flu season, which doesn't help either. So uh, that's, that's kind of the, the, one of the major issues here. Um, they're called coronaviruses because they have a what well, looks like a crown, if you look under an electron microscope here. So here's, I, th I think this one might be SARS. I can't remember. It's, this one's not COVID-19. Um, this one down here is what an anticipated model of it might look like. But uh, as you can see, there, there's kind of these what look like little uh, spokes coming out of it, right? Uh, those are those surface markers that help to get it into your cells. Uh, but it looks kind of like a crown, so that's why they're called coronaviruses. Corona uh, being a Latin word, I believe, for crown. It's definitely the Spanish word for crown, so uh, that's why they're named what they're named, okay? The world has experienced several coronavirus outbreaks even in recent history, uh, but only COVID-19 has risen to this level. Um, so some other ones, SARS, uh, which we'll talk about, MERS, um, those are both coronaviruses, but and they're, they're still very deadly, but they, their outbreaks were not nearly as bad. Okay, So where did this thing first come from? It came from Wuhan, China uh, in late 2019, uh, sometime in November and December of 2019. So there's been a lot of talk about where did this thing originate? How did it come into existence? Right, It wasn't in existence before, so where did it come from? Uh, and so there there been some work to try to trace this back to potentially a wet market in Wuhan. Um, and so essentially what those are uh, is they're markets that have live animals and recently butchered animals, and they're sold on the streets. Uh, and so these animals are kept very close together. They're kept in cages, but the cages are very open. Uh, there, there's very little oversight or regulation on these things, and so it's very easy to have things go from one species to another. So we have this cross-species contamination happening in these markets. Again, there's not really any oversight happening in them. Uh, and so a coronavirus that infects one species of mammal is not guaranteed to infect a different species. So uh, you may have heard about this thing coming from bats. Well, before this thing would have come from bats, this particular coronavirus would have only affected bats. Okay, so we're not, we're not guaranteed for it to move from one species to another. 
And the reason it's able to do that is because of these surface markers, okay? Uh, if those change, all right, then suddenly our cells may decide to pick these up. Instead of uh, recognize it as an invader, they may choose to take it on and start replicating the virus, all right? Uh, it's these surface markers. So if you get a mutation in this virus that changes the, the markers on the surface, uh, it might make it jump from one species to the other. Okay, so as it says here, viruses can mutate very quickly and in the right environment could spread quickly from species to species. So one little mutation happening in a wet market, suddenly instead of infecting just bats, it's cats, it's dogs, it's humans, it's all these other mammals uh, being sold, chickens, birds, things like that going on in the market. So in this small little area there, if you have one or two mutations, you can very quickly get this cross-species contamination, which is not good, okay? Uh, so COVID-19's genome apparently shares about 96% of a match with a coronavirus that infects bats. So that's where they think this thing actually came from, bats, like a, a bat coronavirus. So it's not known for sure, but it seems likely that a mutation in this bat coronavirus allowed it to infect human cells as well. So something changed these surface markers Okay, so our cells now pick this up and start replicating it. So the markers on the cell surface would be recognized by human cells now and allowed to hijack them. So without this mutation, this virus would not have gotten into our cells. It would have just been a virus that infected bats forever and never us, except that we now have some kind of mutation in it that seems to like have spread through these wet markets. Okay, so you may have also heard about us uh, giving out calls to end these wet markets. Um, the, the WHO, World Health Organization, uh, is making moves to do that. Uh, and, and the reason being is that there's kind of the p perfect storm to keep these viral mutations breeding and cross-species contamination. And, and again, there's, there's very little oversight on these street markets. We don't know how things transmit from species to species. It's hard to follow. Uh, and so shutting these down and, and giving it a little bit more regulation should hopefully prevent this species tra to uh, another species transmission again, hope or at least slow it down, um, rather than just spreading it all over the place. So, uh, I, I think this is probably not a bad idea to shut down these wet markets and start regulating some of this, uh, animal trade or meat trade. Uh, it should hopefully start slowing down this from happening again. Um, a lot of these things tend to come from this sort of environment. So probably not a bad idea to get rid of those. Uh, the problem is that this is so ingrained in a lot of cultures, this go get your meat from the market, uh, go get the animals from the market, that it's going to be very hard to change that. And you'll see a lot of resistance, and it's going to take a cultural-wide change uh, in parts of the world to get rid of that. So it might be hard to start, but it's, it's definitely, I think, the right move is to start moving away from this. Okay. Um, so why is COVID-19 so problematic as compared to like some of these other outbreaks, these viral outbreaks that we've seen? Um, so unlike diseases like Ebola and previous coronavirus outbreaks, this one's proving more difficult to control and manage. So kind of taking a look at these other three, Ebola, uh, its major problem is that it's easily transmitted. We talked about yesterday how it gets into all of your bodily fluids and a person infected with it uh, all you have to do is just touch any of their bodily fluids, and there's a very good likelihood that it's going to get inside of you. So, But the problem with Ebola was that it was extremely lethal. It killed most of the people that it infected. So it, you know, it didn't get to last long enough in that person to infect lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, it kills the infected people very quickly. So you know, within a week or two, they're dead. Um, and in this case, like these symptoms of COVID seem to be lasting quite a while. Uh, in addition to some other stuff here. But the other thing with Ebola is it's easily identifiable symptoms, uh, right? We, we know we know what internal bleeding looks like. Uh, if you're bleeding from orifices, we know what you're suffering from. And so for with these easily identifiable systems, it's not like a cold, okay? They're not coughing. They're not sneezing. Um, it's easy to track. We know who has it. There's no mistaking, right? We don't have to develop uh, a test to see if you have Ebola. If you have it, you'll definitely know you have it, and everyone around you will know you have it. Okay, uh, so it was pretty easy to, to watch this, to isolate people, to quarantine people uh, and those that were sick and just we couldn't deal with trying to get them better. We just kind of left them to die because there really wasn't an alternative. So this thing kind of died out, not gone forever, but it, it slowed down tremendously. Also, our medicine got better because we've known about this now for like 30 to 40 years. So 
Um, we're getting a little bit better at treating it, okay? Uh, it's still extremely lethal. We don't want it. Okay, SARS and MERS, these are other types of coronaviruses. Uh, SARS, I think, was Southeast Asia. Uh, I can't remember what the rest of it stood for. Um, respiratory syndrome. There we go. Southeast Asia, respiratory system. Um, it's estimated that the fatality rate of SARS was about 11%, which is still not very good. You know, one in 10 people getting a, a virus would kill them. That, that's not a, an ideal number. Uh, it's definitely lower than Ebola. Okay. Uh, so even at the height of its infectivity, it was still a relatively rare disease, meaning it must have been pretty hard to transmit. Okay. Uh, if, 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 you know, it's still 11% of people are dying from it, that means 90% of people are recovering from it and can pass that on, uh, before they get severely sick. So it must have been pretty difficult to transmit is, is what we're getting at here, right? Even at the height when it was really bad, uh, it was still pretty uncommon. Uh, this other one, MERS, is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, and this obviously happened in the Middle East. Uh, and so this actually came from a bat coronavirus as well that came to infect camels and then infect humans. So it's kind of a, you know, one species to another to humans. Um, this is also much harder to transmit uh, it's also extremely rare. So to make this jump from, you know, one species to another to another, uh, it, it takes quite a bit of, I guess, luck or unluck or whatever you want to call it for that to happen. So this is also extremely rare. Uh, I think there was only maybe like a thousand or so cases of it. It was, it was pretty strong if you, if you got it. It was a very severe infection, um, but also very, very uncommon. So uh, you know, difficult to transmit, right? These last two suffered from difficulty to transmit, uh, this first one suffered from, it was easy to track, and it was extremely lethal. Uh, COVID-19 is going to be opposite of that. It's still lethal. Anything that's going to kill you know, a sizable percentage of people that get it is not good. Uh, we're talking you kind of at minimum here. We're estimating this one to be about 1%, which 1 in 100 people would, would not be good. I mean, you're talking about if you take the population of Rockhurst, uh, you know, 1 in 100 people would kill 10 of our students, which would be tragic. Uh, it's, it's not a, you know, a number that we should just neglect or not think about. It's definitely large enough that we need to consider that. Um, so it only kills 1%. The problem is, is that it seems like it's extremely easy to transmit and that people don't know if they have the symptoms of it. So as we were saying just a second ago, it's not as lethal as other coronaviruses and viruses like Ebola. It is highly contagious. And unlike Ebola, symptoms may not even appear in those infected, leading to easy transmission. That's one of the biggest problems right now. We don't know who's had it. We don't know who has it. People that have it don't even know that they might have it because these symptoms might be so mild. As a virus, it's also generally more difficult to treat. We've talked about that. Uh, there's not a readily available antiviral drug specific to this version of the coronavirus. Uh, we'd have to make that, and that's going to take time. Um, and the other problem is, in the meantime, while we're trying to make a, a, an antiviral drug specific for this COVID-19, uh, there's a chance this thing could mutate, which would be very problematic. If we start getting new variations of this particular virus uh, while we're trying to work on a vaccine or an antiviral drug, then you know that second version of it, the mutated version of it, could just run people over again. So uh, we're, we're really hoping that that doesn't happen. If that happens, it's, it's going to be a very long time before we're really done with this. There's also a huge variation in how strongly this virus infects people. Uh, and that, that I've heard from several doctors that this is actually the, one of the biggest problems with it is that it's unpredictable. Uh, we don't know how bad people are going to suffer from it. Some people have no symptoms at all, right? They're totally fine. They don't even know that they have it. And others require hospitalization or dying from it. So there's just this huge variety of how it infects people. And so this actual lethality rate of, you know, somewhere between 1% to who knows 5%, nobody really knows. Uh, we don't know who's been infected. So we're not going to try to take any chances with this. Um, then there's an estimation that about 20% of people infected need hospitalization. And this is, we'll see here, I'll come back to it again, but this is really why we're, we're doing the quarantine. Um, it's simply because if we have 20% of people of the entire country needing a hospital bed, you know, within a two to three month time period, we will not have the space for it. Uh, we do not have the medical equipment for it. 
Uh, we do not have the number of doctors and nurses and other medical workers to treat that. You're talking the U.S. population is somewhere around 350 million people. So if you're saying 20 percent of them need a hospital bed, you know, and you're talking within a time frame of, you know, two to four months, maybe 50 million people are going to need hospital beds. We do not have that kind of ability. So uh, that's really why we're doing what we're doing is we got to make sure that we don't overrun this healthcare system. Okay, so again, getting back into the why the quarantines, I'm not trying to get political here. This is just simply a scientific point of view. Um, right? th th I'm not trying to choose one side or the other. I'm telling you what I think is, is best, uh, both to protect people's healths and to protect people's livelihoods, Right? how they make money. So I'll, I'll try to get into that later here. Um, but the main reason, and the one I just stated, was that overrunning the healthcare system would cause many unnecessary deaths. Uh, this is the real reason we're doing what we're doing here. Um, hospitals would not have enough beds or medical equipment to treat the infected. Uh, and since this virus is easily transmittable, transmittable, uh, this would likely happen, very likely happen that we just overrun the hospital systems. Uh, and that here's the problem is that people that would otherwise be able to get hospital treatment and survive would die. Okay. Uh, and since we don't really know how it affects individual from individual to individual, we don't, why, why would we take a chance on this? Uh, you know, seemingly normal, healthy adults can die from this. So, uh, and, and they may have survived if they had been able to get medical treatment. So we, we really need to slow this down just so that we can get medical treatment to the people that need medical treatment. Cause there's no sense in dying over this, right? Uh, or we, we can prevent it. We can slow it down. Okay. Your life is more important than any amount of, of money. All right. That that's definitely the case, right? And if you're, if you're a Christian or a Catholic or any sort of religious believing person, I'd hope you'd believe that uh, your life and the lives of those around you are, are, are very important, okay? Uh, and so here's another issue, and again, not being political here, we just had a slow roll out of testing, and that's that's globally. Uh, we just don't really know the true number of infected individuals. Uh, and, and for that reason, we also don't know the true number of, of deaths uh, there could be a lot of deaths that, that may have come from this COVID-19 that we don't know about. Um, right? If you've heard about things in New York, people have apparently died in their homes because they didn't go get medical care, but we don't know if they died from something or if it was this coronavirus. Uh, I heard recently that there was a woman who, well, her body was exhumed. Uh, she had passed away in January. Uh, and so they, they took her out of the grave and did like a post-mortem test and she died in January. Um, and, and she died from apparently the coronavirus. So, and that was before any confirmed U.S. cases. Uh, so it may have been here a lot longer than we knew about. And, and so we don't really know. It's just the slow rollout of testing has really made this whole thing very complicated. I'm not blaming anyone because it's, we, nobody necessarily knows how we could have possibly uh, gotten ready for this, you know, perfectly. But that's definitely a reason that we need to just kind of slow down, stay home, stay inside, avoid going out unless we absolutely have to. Uh, and the last one here, again, this is protecting the vulnerable in society. Uh, you know, many people who otherwise would not be at risk are suddenly now way more likely to, to die. Uh, so comorbidities, that's a term you may see. Um, that means that if, if you're going to die from something, what else did that person have? Um, what other sort of health problems did that person have? And so if you hear the, the news talking about comorbidities or talking about what other conditions did somebody who may have died from COVID-19 have, and a lot of them are heart-related, uh, high blood pressure, diabetes isn't necessarily, but uh, COPD, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, autoimmune diseases, strokes, people who've had strokes, uh, people who've had embolism, people who've had uh, heart attacks, uh, all of those increase your likelihood now, certainly, you know, you have some issues here because you should always be worried about your heart health. If you've had, you know, high blood pressure or strokes or things like that, you should you should be worried about your heart's health. Uh, but now, you know, suddenly you're way more likely to die for no reason except for that this virus suddenly exists. OK, so if this didn't exist, your life would probably continue on perfectly as normal. But now suddenly you're way more vulnerable. And by the way, this group here constitutes a huge percentage of the American population. Uh, I mean, High blood pressure is a huge percentage. I, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, it was something around 40 to 50% of U.S. adults have high blood pressure or borderline high blood pressure. Uh, it's estimated that half the U.S. population uh, over the age of, I think it's 50, is either diabetic or pre-diabetic. 
so we're very close to that. You know, COPD, cardiovascular disease, the number one killer in the U.S. right now is heart disease. It's not cancer. It's not car accidents. It's not even this uh, COVID-19, at least not yet, okay, is heart disease. Uh, you know, so that's the number one killer in the U.S., and now you've got something that complicates heart problems. So uh, you're now way more vulnerable than you might have been before. So Again, if, if we truly care about our neighbors and the people around us, we should try to protect them. Uh, I know that's there's it's going to come at some cost to ourselves, which I'll try to get into towards the end of this video. Okay, so I'm going to try to get into like what how do we return back to normal uh, from a, a scientific perspective? Um, again, this is some of this is just my uh, opinion. Um, you know, some of this is based on kind of what, what's happened in the past and historical records of pandemics and what happens if you go back too quickly. Uh, but I'm going to try to give you as much information as I can try to dispel rumors and also try to like understand, okay, we can't do this forever, right? This, this can't happen forever and ever and ever, uh, cause people need to actually get out of their homes, right? We're not meant to stay inside forever. So, uh, when does this end? So when and how? Uh, let's talk about the how first. So how do we actually end this whole thing? Um, we will only finally be done with this when one or both of these happen. That number one, there is an available vaccine and that it's widely available, not just like we've created a vaccine. People actually have to get it. So we have to produce it. And that's going to take, you know, somewhere between who knows, estimated 12 to 18 months for development. And then who knows how long to mass produce the darn thing. Uh, and then number two, there's a large enough herd immunity. So what happens is as the population starts to get this virus, right? Uh, well, eventually you reach a point where most of your population will have had it, okay? Uh, and so it'll start to level off because you'll, you'll still have some individuals that haven't caught it yet, but at least at some point, most people will have gotten it. Uh, and if it is true that you can't get it again, okay, this section of the population is suddenly now immune, right? Uh, they, they have a herd immunity. Um, and so there's an estimation here that if we can get 90% herd immunity, uh, that we can maybe get back to normal between 90% herd immunity and 90% vaccinated. That gives us that 10% there are people that either couldn't get vaccinated for health reasons or haven't yet, or who haven't gotten the disease. Uh, that 10% now it's pretty safe that we can deal with the medical consequences. Hospitals can manage that percent. Uh, but I, I think we're talking here realistically, uh, you know, kind of a, a year to maybe two years before we're at that point. And that's going to be a while. Now, I'm not saying that that's that's finally done. OK, we're going to take small steps between now and then. Uh, but we won't be done done with this until I, th I think one or both of these things has happened. Um, so we're unlikely to experience large social events both until both of these things occur. Uh, so arenas full of fans like concerts, sporting events are unlikely as it could result in a huge spike of thousands of cases and hospitalizations in a small area. Okay, so if you think about it, like if just one person goes to a Chiefs game and there's 80,000 people and that person touches who knows how many handles, uh, the railings going up, you know, the walkways, the chairs, concession stands, uh, the ketchup dispensers, all that stuff, if that person infects it and touches that. Now imagine, you know, potentially two to 3,000 more people touching that, right, within that one day. Uh, and so you can have huge spread. So I, I think we're unlikely to have fans at sporting events. Doesn't mean zero sports. Um, cause you know, if you're talking about just like a baseball team playing out there, well, there are nine guys on the field and they're all spread out pretty far apart. And the only thing they're all touching is a baseball. And if one guy gets it, uh, we'll, we'll be able to, you know, track that just means we're not going to be going to these things for a while. Um, I, I'd be surprised. I'd be very surprised if we open up these events to huge percentages of people, because I think all we're doing is inviting this uh, to suddenly overwhelm the healthcare system, which so far professional sports and college sports seem to be on board with. So hopefully that, that continues. It does, we can probably get back to a point of being able to watch sports, which I think a lot of you are probably missing. Um, I just don't, I don't know if we're going to be able to go back to them for a while. Um, and anything allowing extremely large social events will likely bring us back to local, state, or national quarantines again. So if you have one guy at a Chiefs game, you know, has this and infects 2,000 people, guess what? Kansas City is going to shut back down. So we're, you know, back to square one, uh, which is not good, right? Nobody wants to do this forever, uh, and, and that's kind of a huge problem here. So if we just kind of open everything back up and then we say, okay, now we got 4,000 people infected in Kansas City because we held one event, well... 
that's a problem, and we're going to go back to just quarantine. So we don't want to do that. Uh, so we talked about the how this thing ends, and I think here's the the win. Uh, I told you maybe 12 to 18 months for it to finally be done. But kind of what what might happen in the meantime? Like, realistically, here's the deal. People can't live like this forever. We're social creatures. Uh, you know, adults need to work. Economies need to function. People need to make money. People need to be financially secure. Uh, but we also need to protect the health of the people around us. And so it's a very difficult balancing act. Uh, and we got to make some concessions here on both sides to make this thing work. Um, I, I think the biggest problem is just reopening on a large scale is going to result in two problems. Number one, you're going to have a large increase in cases and deaths. You're going to overrun hospitals like we've talked about. Uh, and then number two, you're just going to end up back at square one because you're just going to get these reinforcements of a state citywide or even national quarantine if this thing blows up. Uh, and we don't want unnecessary deaths, okay? People are going to get sick from this, right? We're not able to stop that right now, but we want to make sure that they can get access to hospitals and health care if they do get sick. We don't want people dying because they couldn't get the care they needed, right? Uh, so going all back at once is probably going to result in one or two of these things pretty quickly. Uh, and then we just end up back where we started, which, yeah, we just wasted a bunch of time. Like the, What we're doing right now wouldn't have mattered. So we don't really want... I think we should avoid this large scale. Everyone, you know, let's just have Chiefs games happening. Let's pack Sprint Center, stuff like that. Probably not the best path forward. So what do we do to protect people's lives and protect their livelihoods? Uh, and that's that's difficult. Uh, I think the first thing we're going to see here is some small scale reopenings. Uh Probably like early summer, probably late May, early June. Now, if you live in Kansas City, it might be a little bit different because we're a huge population. Uh, but, you know, rural parts of Missouri and Kansas will probably start to open back up pretty soon because uh, they're not as infected or is not as easy to infect those populations because they're already pretty distant from each other. Uh, but beginning in early summer, we'll probably see some small scale reopenings of non-essential businesses, stuff that was told, hey, you don't need to be open right now, so please close. Uh, but I think there's going to be some stipulations on that and how it works. I think you're likely to see limits on building capacities, uh, say, you know, for like the month of May and June. Okay, well, you can only have 25% of your pre-quarantine capacity at once. So, you know, a restaurant that might have originally served 100 people may only be able to serve 25 people at once inside. Uh, and they'll probably spread tables out. You know, they're not going to all be sitting next to each other. Uh, and then if, you know, that goes well and cases don't start blowing up, then maybe, you know, July, August, you see 30%, 40%, 50%. So you just slowly allow this stuff to open back up. We don't just say, all right, restaurants running at 100%. Um, and this can begin to alleviate some of the unemployment and underemployment. So some people can start to get some work. Uh, you know, there's a relief on the uh, unemployment system right now, which is just totally overrun. People can't even get into it trying to get some money so that they can make sure they pay their rent, the groceries, right, their bills. Uh, and that, that's certainly a very, very difficult thing to deal with. But uh, if we go back all at once, and the other thing to consider here is we say restaurants are 100% open, they're running. Uh, I don't think you're going to see people running and flocking these places. I think most of them understand that you know, if we send everybody into a restaurant and pack it to the brim every single night for a couple months, people are going to get sick. Uh, we do want to slow this down. So I think if you say, all right, everything open, well, the problem is then you got businesses with a lot of overhead uh, trying to pay a bunch of people to serve not as many people as they normally would be serving. So I think you're going to see this slow reopening. If we do this right, I think, you know, in the next month, 25, 50 percent, I don't know what the number is. I'm not, you know, I, I can't pretend to know that, but I think you're, you're likely to see something like that. Uh, I think we're likely to see continued social distancing measures. Um, you see, wearing masks in public are going to be just the norm for a long time. Uh, I think remote learning, fellas, it, it's not impossible that this happens at some point next year. Um, I think working from home, uh, if possible, is, is going to be the new norm. I think businesses should look into this, at least for the time being, see if we can't pay people to do jobs from their house. Uh, and a lot of a lot of companies have been very innovative, trying to do stuff, uh, doing trainings online, telehealth, right? We're doing teaching online, um, and, I, and I think this is a, a good strategy to try to get people some livelihood, right? To get their financial situation in a better spot. Okay, so scientists also need to just keep monitoring local and state infections, making sure that cases do not begin to increase too quickly. Should be an extra O there. <laughs> um, 
but be ready to issue quarantines to slow it back down if the cases rise too quickly. So if we, you know, we do this slow opening and find out, okay, uh, we said 25%, but suddenly we've got, you know, 1,500 cases in Kansas City and this thing could explode, uh, we'll be, have to be ready to shut back down if that happens. Um, we're going to have cases. We just need to keep the numbers manageable to prevent unnecessary deaths. Okay, that's the idea here. We're trying to get people back to work so they can make money, they can pay their bills, they don't have to rely on unemployment, businesses start functioning again, uh, but we just want to make sure that we don't overrun the healthcare system. Okay, now here's where things will probably start to get interesting in terms of going back and, and going back to the society that we, we know. Uh, I think the fall is going to be an interesting time. Um, August and September. Returning to school will likely be one of the hardest tests we face as a society. Um, I mean, distance learning is difficult, and it's not a true replacement for actually being at school. And I think you guys would agree with that. Uh, this is not ideal. You don't learn, I think, as well. You're not able to ask questions. You don't see each other. You don't get to hang out with your friends. Uh, and, and so this is just, it's not a replacement for actual school. Um, so coming back to the school in the fall will certainly increase the number of cases across the country. So if we, you know, come back in August and September, uh, no matter what we do, uh, it's going to increase cases across the country. Like just, it's just, there's so much social interaction that happens at school uh, it's going to do that. Uh, but at the same time, we can't do distance learning forever. So I, I think we're going to see probably, again, if we do things right, uh, some ideas here that we're probably going to be wearing masks in school just so that we don't spread it to each other. Uh, you'll probably be disinfecting surfaces. People will probably bring their own disinfectants just to make sure you don't uh, you know, sit in somebody else's desk, touch their you know, sneeze or cough or whatever. Um, no unnecessary touching, both surfaces and other people. So, you know, like giving your buddy a hug uh, or, you know, tapping him on the arm, stuff like that. Like, we're probably not going to be okay with that. Uh, I know that kind of stinks because that's part of the, the reason you want to go back to school is just actually being able to, like, hug your friends. Uh, and so that's something we probably won't be doing a lot of. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of digital assignments to avoid touching papers, things like that. Uh, just minimize the amount of contact with other people, but still being in a building with each other, okay? Because uh, we have to keep in mind, as, as rockers, there, there are many students, teachers, and parents that are at a higher risk of dying from COVID-19, so this will have to be a delicate balancing act, all right? Plenty of your fellow students have things like asthma. Uh, they may have parents that have, you know, had cancer, and so they are more susceptible to die from this, or parents with high blood pressure, uh, or they're just, you know, grandparents that are old, or some, you know, they may have a brother or sister who has got a really bad uh, health condition that just, this would just kill them. So it, it's not necessarily fair to ask those individuals, hey, you have to come back to school because they'd be putting their family at risk. So it's going to be a very difficult balancing act um, and one that we're going to have to, to weigh how we're going to do it. So as we go back to school, scientists are going to really have to monitor infection rates. Um, the amount of social interaction, like I said, that happens at school just provides a huge avenue for a virus to spread. Um, there's just so many people touching things, talking to each other, hugging each other. You know, you got salad bar and the, the deli bar at the lunchroom. Uh, there's just all kinds of stuff here, uh, you know, touching rails, everything. So there's just that's going to really inf uh, change the amount of people that get infected. And we bring it home to our families. Or your family could give it to you and you bring it to the school. It's just There's just so much interaction. Um, it's entirely possible that we have distance learning again next year if cases begin to spike locally. Or even if just we know within Rockers we've got a few people that get sick with it, we, this may happen again. Uh, it's not a guarantee, but I, I wouldn't rule this out. Uh, you know, just, it, it might happen. Um, and so as we move into winter, uh, November, December, January, uh, expected, there's an expected rise in cases as a second wave is likely. Uh, people are already tired of quarantine. We're not, you know, just barely over a month into this thing. And you've already got this quarantine fatigue. People are sick of being in their house. They want to get out. They want to drive around. They want to go back to the life they're used to living. Uh, and so, you know, as this goes on, that's only going to become harder and harder for people to resist that temptation to just go out and do stuff, to go hang out with their buddies, to go visit their grandparents. OK, uh, but as winter comes around, there's an ex already an expected second wave going to be hit uh, or going to hit us. And historically, second waves are almost 
always worse than the initial one. Uh, because people are like, oh, we dealt with that already. We're going to be fine. And so they don't necessarily take it as seriously. Uh, the 1918 Spanish flu that hit uh, the second wave was significantly worse. Um, and a lot of that was just people thought, oh, we're good. We've already dealt with it. And so they didn't necessarily take it as seriously. It killed a lot more people the second time around. So people are already getting tired of quarantine and these new restrictions. And so we may see some cases popping up in the winter, so a large number of cases, and that's just not in you know Kansas City. That could be across the country. So something we got to keep an eye on constantly. And if it does get bad, we'll probably have to go back to what we're doing. Again, none of this is necessarily a guarantee because we don't truly know, uh, but we just need to be ready for it, right? We got to plan as if it could happen. Okay, so that's kind of the, you know I, I think what the next few months may look like, um, but when does large scale reopening happen? Um, again, we are trying to save both lives and livelihoods, people's lives and their financial security. Uh, I, I think at the earliest, you're talking 12 to 18 months uh, if we want to get this right. Uh, you know, we're about a month or so into this and it's we're barely, at the, you know, getting into it. So uh, if we want to do it right, you know, we could do this wrong and just rush everything back. And at which point I think we're just going to end up with a lot of unnecessary deaths and we're going to be starting from scratch with new quarantines. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that we do this right. Uh, just kind of a slow, uh, process. We get herd immunity building up slowly as some people do get infected. Um, those not already infected will begin getting vaccines towards the end of this. So I, th I think then we can start talking about having large gatherings. Okay. Concerts, sporting events, uh, graduations and things like that, you know, that you're just normally used to doing. Uh, I don't, I don't think we're going to be there for quite a while, at least again, if we want to do this right. So what does the world look like for the time being? This is going to be the new normal. Um, I think working from home will and should become more commonplace in society. Uh, I don't, I don't think school is ideally done like this. Um, I, I think that's going to have to, we're going to have to eventually come back. I don't know how that's going to, what that's going to look like. Um, but it's going to be a very difficult decision, a very delicate balancing act. Um, and I do want to spend some time just talking about what does this mean as like a, a Christian or a Catholic or somebody even educated in like the Jesuit tradition? Uh, like what, how should we look at this? Um, and so this is maybe my, my, from my days of when I used to teach theology a while back, like how would I look at this from a, you know, from Christ's perspective, from the church's perspective, uh, from an Ignatian perspective, like how would I approach this? So, uh, like, what does it mean to be a man or woman for others? Now, you guys probably, as, as freshmen, uh, you know, you hear "man for others." We want you to be a man for others, um, and that's that's a saying that's been around since like I think the 1970s or so. Uh, I don't want to say Pedro Rupe started that, if I remember everything correctly, but uh, he said we want men and women for others. That that your lives are living for other people, right? Your goal is to serve humankind. Well, uh, this is actually, what does that, does that actually mean, right? That means putting the needs and health, in this case, of complete strangers ahead of ourselves, our needs, and our, our wants. Uh, and that can be tough, Um Right. And like, well, where's the where's the biblical perspective on this? Right. I know there's a lot of again, not trying to get political, but there's a lot of like pastors who are in defiance of the U.S. orders and, and trying to hold services. And, you know, shouldn't they be able to do that? Well, no one's preventing you from being a Christian right now. We're just saying, please don't you know infect others. Uh, we should be looking out for others. Uh, and, and so here's kind of my if you want to just pull straight from the words of Jesus himself. Uh, you know, John 13, there's this, the famous one, no greater love is there than this, but to lay down one's life for a friend. Okay. Again, giving yourself to other people. Yeah, this might be difficult, uh, being a man for others, but it's, I'm going to have to give something up for other people. Um, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, this is the parable of the sheep, uh, and, and the goats, uh, where, you know, God puts, uh, one of them on one side and one on the other. And he says to the sheep, you know, whatever you did to the least of my brothers, you did to me. And he tells the goats, whatever you didn't do for them, you didn't do for me. Right. So whatever you're doing for the least in society, you're doing for God. Right. OK. All right. Ad mayorum de gloriam here, huh, fellas? OK. Whatsoever you do for the least 
of your brothers, right? Rockhurst, Kansas City, right? The United States, the world, right? You're doing it to him, right? You're doing it for him. So uh, you know, I'd like to think that coming straight from the words of Jesus himself, he, he's he, this is not an easy thing to do, and he knows that when he's saying it, uh, but he, he's telling us this is what we should aim to do. This is what we should be like. Uh, and if you're wondering, by the way, Romans like 13, 1 to 2, uh, so not necessarily words from Jesus, but, you know, we're talking about epistles here. Uh, basically, this whole thing is about how, you know, we should listen to government authorities uh, because ultimately all authority comes from God. And so we should just listen to them. Uh, and anyone who doesn't listen to them brings judgment upon themselves. So all these preachers are like, we're going to be in, out in defiance of all this. Well, there's actually some words in the gospel here that say, hey, we should be looking out for each other. Right, that that's most important, and then ultimately, like you know, we'll, we'll follow the government rules here. Uh, you know, we're we're not taking away your right to be a Christian. We're just saying, please don't meet in large groups for the time being. And I, I think that's a totally reasonable thing to ask. Ask no one's necessarily taking away uh, your religious freedom. No one's banning Christianity, Catholicism, Judaism, whatever. Like none of that's being banned. We're just we're trying to look out for each other, right? Which is ultimately, I think, part of what Christ's message was. Okay. Yeah. And, and I recognize this hurts on a lot of levels. Uh, socially, this, this stinks. Right? You don't get to hang out with your friends. Uh, you don't get to see some of your family members. Holidays are going to look very different. Uh, you don't get to go to concerts. You don't get to go to sporting events. We don't have prom. We don't have graduation. Uh, you know, th this stuff hurts because that's, we look forward to these things, right? Hanging out with each other. We're social creatures. We're meant to go hang out. We're meant to have good times and enjoy life. Uh, but right now, a lot of that's gone uh, because we're giving up some of that for other people. And that hurts. Um, and the one that really hurts is, is economically. And maybe as, as students, you know, it may not affect you as much. But I imagine some of your parents are, are truly worried about, you know, the how they're going to get out of this financially. A lot of people are now unemployed or underemployed, meaning they don't get as many hours as they had before. Uh, and that hurts. Uh, I mean, it's, if you don't know how you're going to be able to pay the bills, your rent for groceries, things like that, that that's scary. Um, and it's, it's a little bit more common in the rockers community than you might think. Uh, and so we have, this is, this is tough. This is really, really tough. Um, you know, we can try to do some government help to do that, right? You've heard about stimulus payments. You've heard about small business loans, uh, right? We have unemployment, uh, but that stuff is just so overrun right now with people that need help. Um, so this is, if we're going to try to get this right and help people who are trying to help others, uh, hopefully the government can try to get some of this stuff in order so that small business loans actually go to small businesses and not these large companies that seem to take a cut of it. Uh, right. The people that call in for unemployment actually get unemployment payments. Um, right. It's, it's just going to be tough and we've got to fix this. Because uh, we can't do this forever, right? We can't stay at home forever. That's not how we're meant to live. That's not how society's supposed to be. Um, but we need some relief in the meantime. So we, we got to take care of that. But we got to look out for each other first, right? Okay, that's kind of the ultimate thing here. Uh, financially, we can try to, we can recover. Uh, but if you're dead, you're dead, right? If, if we're talking about looking out for the health of other people, if you're dead, you're dead. And if we're not doing things to help people stay alive, well, are, are we really living for others? And this is going to be the toughest part here, I think. Maybe not for you as a student, but for adults, uh, economically, that's tough. Uh, and I, I can recognize that. That's not easy to do. Um, and this is part of why, like, I always, you know, aside from my first hour, guys, uh, you know, who, with the prayers done over the, the loudspeaker, uh, I always say the prayer for generosity, right? Teach me to be generous. Teach me to serve you as you deserve. To give and not to count the cost. To fight and not to heed the wounds. To toil and not to seek for rest. To labor and not to ask for reward, right? Save that of knowing that I do your will. Do you? Do we believe that, right? Are we saying, okay, I'm going to do this for you, right? And what do you want me to do? You're saying, I want you to look out for others and stay home, okay, and be responsible. Do we really believe that or do we just say it, Okay. Uh, that's why I, I love this prayer because it, it applies in so many different senses, but especially right here, right? Do we really believe that, right? God's will is looking out for other people. I'd like to think that's God's will. So let's try to, to do that. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, you know, like, what does it mean to be a man or woman for others? Keeping doctors, nurses, and all those involved in healthcare and in, in front of our own needs and wants. 
So every time we break these quarantine rules, all we're doing is increasing the stress on the healthcare system and the mental stress of those trying to provide care for the infected and just really prolonging this quarantine for everyone. Okay, right? Those people who are working in the hospitals right now, uh, I have several friends who are nurses and doctors. They are stressed out and they're not even in New York City. They're just in the Midwest here and they're already stressed out. Uh, you may have heard about the, the woman who died uh, in the hospital here in Kansas City. She was a nurse who was set to retire. Uh, her son went to Rockhurst High School, you know, and his mom passed away uh, because she didn't have, you know, protective equipment and we weren't treating this seriously. So we, we really just got to look out for the health care of other people. Uh, and I know that that's tough to hear because Americans generally want to look after themselves first. Not everybody, but that, that's generally the kind of perception. I'm going to look after me and then I'll worry about other people. Uh, and this is the first time I think we're at least in a very long time, maybe since, you know, World War II, that we're going to have to look out for the needs of others first, especially healthcare workers and those people who are now more likely to you know, suffer from this. But anyways, um, go, I'll go ahead and add a question in here for you to give me your thoughts, maybe ask a question. And then, uh, during one of our review days, if you guys have your thoughts, please let me know as well. <laughs> 